the vicious Pacific struggle of World War II. One class of fighting machine was at the spearhead of every battle. At the time, it was the largest warship America had ever built. With the ability to launch hundreds of fighter bombers against shipping and island bases, it tore into the heart of the enemy. In the bitter and often suicidal battle for the Pacific, it wrought terrifying destruction on the Japanese and brought about ultimate victory. The US aircraft carrier. It's the largest ship I'd ever seen in my life, and it just, it sort of frightened me, it was so big. It'll beat the hell out of you, but if you hit it, you can hurt it bad. Using extraordinary color archive film and reenactments, Battle Stations takes you beneath the decks of the mightiest ship in the Pacific War, the aircraft carrier. The morning of December the 7th, 1941. A Japanese task force comprising of six aircraft carriers is 270 miles north of Hawaii. At 6 a.m. they launch their 360 aircraft. Two hours later, they attack the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. By 10 a.m., the U.S. Pacific Fleet is destroyed. Of its eight battleships, six are either sunk or severely damaged, along with three cruisers and three destroyers. America was at war. Never before had so much shipping been destroyed by enemy aircraft that had been launched from carriers. These mighty ships had come of age as fearsome machines of war. Yet only 30 years earlier, they had been looked on as nothing more than an interesting experiment. On November the 14th, 1910, a 24-year-old American pilot called Eugene Ely became the first to successfully take off from a ship when he took his Curtis biplane from the deck of a cruiser. Carrier aviation had been born. Though the experiment had opened a few navy eyes, it did not loosen its purse strings. A ship built specifically to launch planes was considered ridiculous. Instead, the US developed a floating platform for seaplanes. America was fast losing out to other nations in the development of naval aviation. Britain was quick to recognize the potential of planes equipped with ordnance operating from ships. By June 1913, a landing platform had been built on board one of its cruisers, HMS Hermes. Two years later, the Royal Navy was operating aircraft from five modified vessels. Following the British lead of converting ships for use as aircraft platforms, the US Navy selected a Collier to become America's first aircraft carrier. Named the USS Langley, she was commissioned in 1922. Although ungainly, she would be the first in a large and fearsome family of naval vessels. But the problems of landing and taking off on a moving vessel were enormous. This new science was having its fair share of teething problems. But across the other side of the world, another country was also beginning to develop its own carriers. Japan had seized on the importance of naval aviation and carrier development was a high priority. By the mid-1920s, its building program was far more advanced than the US. But it was Japan's invasion of China in 1937 that sent a wake-up call to the world. America, conscious of the threat in the Pacific, immediately ordered the construction of a new generation of carriers, more powerful, with greater range and load-carrying capabilities. Amid growing international tension, three carriers were commissioned, the Yorktown, Enterprise, and Wasp. Though theoretically capable of launching a devastating attack, the modern aircraft carrier had never before been used offensively. 
But on the morning of December the 7th, 1941, everything changed. Pearl Harbor had conclusively proved the effectiveness of a carrier force. Grievously wounded, America needed to show that it could take the fight back to Japan. In an audacious move on April the 18th, 1942, an American carrier struck at the very heart of Japan. Taking off from the USS Hornet, 16 B-25s commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle bombed Tokyo. In reality, the raid caused little damage, and the Japanese people were able to go about their normal business. But in America, the psychological impact was enormous. A carrier had struck at the very seat of power of the Japanese emperor, a city thought to be impervious to enemy action. The American public was really down. They had nothing to shout about. All of a sudden, it shows up in the papers, Tokyo bombed and the attitude of the American public immediately changed. Again, the carrier had demonstrated that even distant enemies were vulnerable to attack. But would there be time for America to build new carriers before Japan had swept across the whole of the Pacific? Despite the devastation of the American Pacific Fleet by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor, three U.S. carriers had miraculously escaped. The Saratoga, Lexington, and Enterprise were at sea when the attack took place. These three were now all that stood between Japan and defeat. Immediately, plans to supply the Pacific Fleet with 40 new carriers were reviewed and put into action. The new Essex-class carrier was chosen to be the foundation of America's rebuilding program. Intended to carry more aircraft, the Essex-class was over 800 feet long and at 27,000 tons was more than a third heavier than any of its predecessors. And armor protection was greatly improved. These features, with the provision of a vastly improved battery, such as the main armament of eight five-inch guns, 17 40mm Bofors guns and 60 20mm Ehrlichan guns gave the ships a much enhanced survivability. In a Herculean effort, five shipyards in Virginia, Massachusetts, New York and Philadelphia worked around the clock to produce 24 of these colossal vessels, each one bigger than a major New York skyscraper. It looked like a warship, but uh, I'd say 10 to 20% of the shipyard workers were ladies. And you heard of Rosie the Riveter. Well, it was Rosie the Welder. If you can picture a brand new hotel with nothing in any of the rooms, nothing. That was my first introduction to the ship. The construction of the Essex-class aircraft carriers exemplified America's awesome industrial capability. Tens of thousands of workers rushed to get these much-needed vessels into the front line. In a remarkable industrial achievement, the shipyards produced the carriers far ahead of schedule, in some cases by as much as 17 months. The American people also played their part. A Massachusetts insurance company offered a special bond drive to raise funds for a carrier. The drive raised enough money not only to build the ship, but to pay for its operating expenses for a year as well. And as these mighty ships began to emerge from the shipyards, there was now a need for sailors to man them. Since the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, I had been wanting to get into service, and I wasn't old enough. So finally, when I became 16, I, my mother, I begged my mother to just let me go because I couldn't stand it anymore. I really wanted to get in. I really wanted to kill the Japs. For many of these young men, it was the first time they had ever seen an aircraft carrier. Oh, my Lord, I thought that thing really floats. Uh, it was huge. 
It was a total of uh, about 17 stories from the bottom of the keel to the very top of the topmast. It was a monstrous thing. I walked along the dock here in Pearl Harbor looking at it, and my sea bag was as big as I was, and I was looking at this. It's the largest ship I'd ever seen in my life, and it just sort of frightened me. It was so big. The building and crewing of these carriers was given top priority. Both America and Japan realized that the carrier was vital to victory in the Pacific and rushed to get these fortresses seaborne. The role of aircraft carriers to uh, carry airplanes, <laughs> the fighting weapons, so to speak, the dive bombers, the uh, fighters, torpedo planes, and scout planes and to carry them forward in the area in operations in a group of ships from one spot to another forward in the Pacific. With this in mind, both camps realized that sinking the opposing carrier fleet was the only way to victory. In the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942, US and Japanese ships engaged in a unique battle. It was the first time carrier aircraft had been deployed against carriers. During the battle, the USS Lexington was hit by three bombs and two torpedoes. But the next major naval engagement of the war would prove to be the turning point in the Pacific, the Battle of Midway. In an attempt to occupy the tiny but strategically important island of Midway, the Japanese sent a four-carrier task force to draw out the American fleet in the Pacific. The principal objective was the destruction of America's carriers. On the morning of June the 4th, 1942, Japanese carrier-based torpedo and dive bombers attacked. The USS Hornet launched strikes against the Japanese carriers, but its aircraft were met by overwhelming fighter opposition. Of the 41 torpedo planes launched by the American carrier, only six returned. But the battle was not lost. The dive bombers of USS Enterprise and Yorktown fearlessly attacked the fleet. In the final tally, four Japanese carriers had been destroyed. Midway was a decisive battle, and one that would have a far-reaching impact on the war in the Pacific. You can build another airplane, you can build another carrier, but the Japanese did not do what the Americans did. When we had expert pilots, been in combat and everything, they sent them back to the States to train more people. The Japanese kept them out there, and we killed them. That was the mistake the Japanese made. America, too, suffered a carrier loss, the USS Yorktown. Despite this loss, Midway established the supremacy of the carrier in naval warfare. They were hailed as the new queens of the sea. But to the sailors, it became all too clear that each engagement would be a battle to the death. As the battle for the Pacific intensified, Life was about to become a day-to-day -day challenge for the men on board the cities of steel. Despite the success of the carrier force at Midway, the battle for the Pacific in 1942 had been costly. Three US carriers had been sunk. America needed new flat tops and needed them quickly. By December, the first of the new Essex-class carriers was commissioned and ready to enter the Pacific War. When you go out underneath that Golden Gate Bridge, because you know you're going, you don't know whether you're going to come back or not, this kind of thing. It's really uh, an emotional thing watching as it disappears. That's when you get that lonesome, melancholy feeling. Home to nearly 3,000 officers and crew, the aircraft carrier is actually a floating city. Through miles of corridors encased by armor plating, each man had to learn how to live and work in close confines. It was 3,000 guys on that ship. And the noise was, uh, there were always uh, revving airplanes on a hangar deck. Of course, 
up on the flight deck, it was just as bad. Walking around the ship, you had to learn to duck and step at the same time, going through the hatches, or you hit your head, or hit your ankle. Of course, down below, it was hot. It was a floating city. Uh, you could get a haircut on there. You could uh, get a Coke. You could uh, get a candy bar. You could buy your cigarettes, incidentally, at five cents a package back then. And we had our own hospital on board. It was just like a floating city. The uh, bunks were uh, four high. They were lengthy enough for a six foot tour like myself. Mine was the bottom uh, unit, probably uh, three to four inches off of the deck. And to get in, I'd have to lay down and roll into the deck, you know, while everybody else climbed to the top. Meals were cooked in shifts, each accommodating almost 500 men in one sitting. Well, of course, they had all kinds of names for the, you know, collision mats with hydraulic fluid. That, of course, was uh, pancakes and French toast and maple syrup and that type of thing. And then the eggs and the milk were powdered. They weren't exactly the tastiest thing, but there are some other boys that were digging trenches someplace else eating food that we didn't have to eat. At least ours was hot. Deep below the waterline, engineers, ratings, Radar operators, cooks, fire crews, and officers carried out their duties. In the armories where we belted the ammunition for the guns, it was just a room. Eventually, they put bunks in there for us so we could sleep in there. And down below, it, when you were down in, in the magazine and all, well, you had to be careful there because of the, the, the bombs would sweat, and that was explosive. And we put the bombs on a, a hoist, on a rack, and sent them up to the elevator and sent them topside. But you had to be careful what you were doing. Care and a certain finesse was also needed when steering the 27,000 ton Goliath. You got the ship in your hands. You steer a ship with your fingers and your toes. And if you can't feel the ship in your toes, and your fingers, you can't steer it. You become a part of this ship. Your feet and hands are the controls. Working 15-hour days, crews soon learned that life aboard a carrier was not all it was cracked up to be. Of course, you had watches to stand to. You were assigned to a watch on the hangar deck or something. You had watches at night. It, it, it ceased to be glamorous. Uh, like we saw in the movies. It was work. There were times when the crews could take a much needed break, but total relaxation was non existent. The alarm to man battle stations could be just seconds away. All of a sudden, you hear that bong, 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 bong going, the klaxon going off. You know that, hey, move it. Let go, let go. Everything's moving. Uh, every leg and every arm. We were all there on, on duty uh, within a matter of about two, two and a half minutes. It was just a, it was a mad rush, everybody, to get to their station. And you wanted to make sure you got there. Whether you were a firefighter or a baker, everyone had their battle station duties. On the flight deck, there was a constant state of frenzied activity. It was here that nearly 100 aircraft were prepared for takeoff. Landing control officers organized and reorganized the constant traffic of bombers and fighters, ensuring that the runway remained clear for use. The fear of accidents was everywhere. The propeller planes created a situation with the, the blade chopping close to the flight deck, that is, in inches from the wood and that. And these sailors would actually be working in front of them, and they would be sliding towards the props, and they would duck around this and that. Uh, uh, it, it was dangerous work. At any time, you may have 45 props going at one time, and the wind situation is terrible. And each plane had a chalk and helped to help the uh, wheels. And when the pilot got ready to go, 
the flight deck crew had to jerk those chocks out. And the planes were so close together that if you didn't know where you were, you could back into a prop real easy. And you had to work your way onto the fuselage or around in back of the tail or maybe in front of the plane to get over to the side with that chock. As light as we were back then, we were so young and light. Some of us weighed only 130 pounds, 135 pounds. Well, the wind, if we didn't hold on to those cleats in the flight deck, we would just get blown over. Fire was the greatest enemy of the aircraft carrier. The ship was a giant floating petrol station and ammunition store. Deep within its hull were tanks that held thousands of gallons of aviation gas. There were also ammunition stores and over a million gallons of fuel oil for the carrier. A crash or explosion could spell disaster. No one on board ignored the implications. It's a heavyweight boxer with a glass jaw. It will beat the hell out of you. But if you hit it, you can hurt it bad. You see, it's carrying tons and tons and tons and tons of bombs and torpedoes and everything in this ship, the bowels of this ship. We'd carry about 550,000 gallons of gasoline alone for the airplanes. And we'd carry over a million gallons of uh, fuel oil. See, its own destruction is it's carrying within its bowels if you hit it. An equally tempting target was the flotilla of support vessels that provided crucial supplies to the carrier task force. This fast-moving fleet would follow the carriers into the treacherous waters of the Pacific. Here, every three or four days, they would replenish the carriers with essential armaments, fuel, food, and medical assistance. By late 1943, the battle for the Pacific Islands intensified, and the carriers were at the spearhead of all the attacks. Wave after wave of aircraft were hurled at the Japanese. But for the carrier crews, getting the returning planes back on board was as dangerous as the enemy attacks. We had a large number of crashes, mostly from battle damage, and sometimes the pilot would be wounded, and uh, we had one uh, 20 or 40 millimeter exploded almost in his cockpit, and he was blinded. And how he landed, Lord knows, I don't. The plane went up, sliding up the flight deck on his belly, and I had to run back towards the railing on the side of the ship. I was just up there watching, and uh, he kept veering to the right, veering to the right. He came crashing into that, and the wing up close hit, and it pivoted it. The rear end of that plane hit that island structure, and it just came apart right behind the cockpit. He unstrapped his chute, walked out of it, and he looked at it. He couldn't believe it either. He was dumbfounded when he looked at that. If you had no business on the flight deck, you didn't go because your longevity wouldn't be very long. When an air airplane catches a fire, and if you don't get it out real quick, they're going to go off. When the fire happens, uh, you get as close to it as you can, and there's two men on a hose, one lead man and the other eight feet behind him to hold the hose. You always had your head singed, and your eyebrows gone, and your eyelids gone. For those pilots that went into the sea and were lucky enough to be rescued, the carriers had a unique way to reward the rescuers. What we would do is if a pilot should, uh, for example, he's going to land his plane on the ship and the tail hook wouldn't catch and he'd go over the side. When he did, a destroyer would pick him up. And then as soon as they could, they would come alongside the tail and fan tail of the ship, come upside of it. And in a boatswain's chair, they would send a pilot over to us. In return, we would give them 15 gallons of ice cream. And they were to, to return our cans the next time. So our pilots really didn't hardly get their feet wet. 
when they hit the water to destroy your atom because they wanted that ice cream. <laughs> That's what it was. Throughout the latter half of 1943 and into 1944, the carrier task forces began to claw back the Pacific Islands. The aggressive Rear Admiral Michener, the veteran who had commanded the USS Hornet on the Doolittle Raid and at Midway, forged a new task force. Task Force 58, as it would now be called, became the most powerful and self-sufficient naval force in history. On the morning of June the 18th, 1944, wave after wave of Japanese aircraft from their carriers and the island of Saipan attacked Task Force 58. The Battle of the Philippine Sea had begun. In some of the fiercest dogfights of the war, nearly every Japanese aircraft was shot down in what became commonly known as the Marianas Turkey Shoot. When the battle was over, Japan had lost 480 aircraft and nearly all of their carrier-trained pilots. More significantly, Japan had lost three aircraft carriers. With the loss of these carriers, the Japanese fleet was finished. But the bloodiest phase of the war in the Pacific had just begun. In desperation, Japan resorted to a weapon the US was ill-equipped to fend off. A weapon so fearsome, it could wreak havoc among the US carriers. Japan's divine wind the kamikaze. By mid-1944, the Pacific War had seen the near destruction of the Japanese Imperial Navy. But as the bitter fighting on the islands continued, a new and deadly battle between ship and plane was about to begin. Desperate to defend themselves against the American march towards their home islands, the Japanese initiated a plan for special attack, or suicide missions. The plan, which was hoped would save Japan, was called Kamikaze, or Divine Wind, in honor of the typhoon that had saved their country from a Mongol invasion in the 13th century. The Kamikazes were unique in military history. Adhering to the warrior code of Bushido, the Japanese pilots prepared themselves for the ultimate sacrifice, to die protecting the Chrysanthemum Empire. I could never understand somebody doing what the emperor wanted you to do, just sacrifice your own life. I didn't want to sacrifice my life, I wanted to live. It's hard to understand that somebody else would say, I'd rather be a dead hero than a a live combatant. In October 1944, the Japanese began their kamikaze onslaught. American carriers were the prize targets, and the Japanese pilots were instructed to aim at the flight deck at the carrier's island. They came at us in waves of 250 to as high as 400 in a unit. And uh, the, the scary ones, I think, would be the ones that came out of the 25,000 feet and came straight down, you know. Those, those are hard to stop, you know. You just hope that they weren't aiming at you, you know. When they attacked, you know, all our five inches and 40 millimeters and 20 millimeters, they were all, they just fell to sky just like a pepper. There wasn't any sky except for the smoke. Shells exploding, kamikazes coming down through it. When the, the 20 millimeters went off, well, let me put it this way. You can't dig a foxhole in a steel deck, but I tried. <laughs> We had one make a torpedo run on us. And he got through all the guns. And when he got right to the edge of the flight deck, the plane just lifted up and he still had his torpedo on. And you could have stood on the flight deck and touched him as he come over the flight deck. And as soon as he got over the flight deck, he went in a drink. Everything on the bridge is shaking. 
and the bulkheads would bounce back and forth like my arm illustrated. Uh, it was rather hairy. And then the cordite smoke had come back in the helmsman, and the, the helmsman, he's working in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> We had four or five inch guns, that's two turrets, firing in front of us, and a quad of 40s in front of us, that's four. And quads on top and a battery 20 millimeters. And if they all got fired at one time, you couldn't hear a thing. Now the captain was out on the starboard wing of the bridge, and a raid came in and he wanted me to turn right. Now, I, I'm not going to hear anything he says. He just popped in the bridge and reached in and beat me on the arm, beat me on the right arm, and he ran back. Turned the rudder full, right, and away we went. As the battle proceeded, he'd run back and beat me on the other arm. We never rehearsed this. One time he hit me on the shoulder like that, and he, oh, and straightened her out. That's the way we were com communicating under that thunder of noise. Hey, Christopher, a sailor's are famous for that. But when one would come in on us, we would we would curse and and when they were when we'd pass them a flaming in the ocean, we would curse them as we passed them in the water. By early 1945, Japanese kamikaze raids were reaching a new intensity. During the invasion of Iwo Jima, Japanese suicide pilots targeted the carrier USS Franklin. The date was March the 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Don Ziegler was on the bridge of the USS Yorktown and tried to warn the Franklin that the incoming planes were not friendly. The carrier Franklin was just right there on the horizon and the plane started towards their formation. Now, we radioed her. We have bogeys acquired. Combat. Uh, they radioed back, friendly. We radioed back, a bogey. I repeat, we have acquired uh, target set uh, bearing one, two, zero. They radioed back, friendly. Then we radioed back, visual, visual, visual. We're looking at it with binoculars. And then the next instance, up went to Franklin. The explosion kind of picked me up and threw me across the, the wardroom tables. And uh, that was the beginning of a very harrowing 12 hours or 15 hours. And the ship start blowing up. I counted 46 explosions and stopped counting because they, there was still more going. I uh, went back aft, went back and on outboard the ship and got into the secondary con, which was then enveloped in, from the flight deck, fires and explosions. They were going thousands, 2,500 feet in the air. She finally goes dead in the water, and most of the guys are just hollering, get, get off that son of bitches, what they were really wanting them to get off, because she's just blowing up from one end to the other. The Franklin had taken two massive human bombs and was mortally wounded. Her crews desperately fought the fires in an effort to save the ship. But deep below her decks on level four, trapped men were battling to save their lives. There was no way out, and the fire was coming up behind us. Uh, there was above us uh, a, a hatch. The paint was coming off the wall. That's how hot it was. You couldn't touch the bulkheads. I found a piece of metal from a bunk or something, and I started pounding on it. It was too hot to touch up there. And we just Pounding on that, one guy you know, arm would get tired, we'd pass it to somebody else and he'd pound. And we just kept that up continually. And in fact, it was so hot that uh, 
several of the, the crewmen took off their sheets, their t-shirts or whatever they had on, folded them neatly and urinated in them, and reversed them to get breathing so they could get some air through, the, through their t-shirts. Somebody suggested we say the 23rd Psalm. And uh, I don't think there was one of us who knew it uh, in its uh, continuity from <laughs> one, the beginning, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. <coughs> he restoreth my soul. He guided me down the path. Each contributed at least a thought, a sentence, or a part of that song so that we got the, we didn't miss a part. We got it, we got it all glued together. <laughs> thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. <coughs> Above the trapped men, firefighters heard their cries and were trying to cool the hatch down with high pressure hoses. I couldn't see how I could die that young. And there's so many men that died were younger than I, you know. With time running against them, the rescue team finally managed to get to the hatch. After a long period of time, uh, we heard some tapping above. And uh, as we looked up, uh, we could see that the, the wheel uh, was starting to move a little bit, and then more. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, they flung the hatch open from above. We went right up through there and down the, forward on the hangar deck with the fire hoses on each side of us. And uh, so we all got out of there. Incredibly, the Franklin survived, but at a huge loss. 724 men were killed and 265 were wounded. But it wasn't the end there was still one island left to conquer. It has since gone down as one of the bloodiest battles in world history, Okinawa. By April 1945, American forces were racing towards the very heartland of Japan. Crucial to the success of the invasion would be the capture of the strategic island of Okinawa, a mere 350 miles from the mainland of Japan. If the battle for Iwo Jima had been a hard-fought and bloody engagement, the battle for Okinawa reached new levels of ferocity, earning it the nickname, the Island of Death. Once again at the forefront of this strike force were the Essex-class carriers of the Pacific Fleet. And once again, Japan's kamikazes targeted the American carriers, wave after wave of them. On the morning of April the 6th, radar began to pick up large formations of aircraft heading directly towards the fleet. My area of, of operation usually was in a, an area called Combat Information Center. If the pl enemy planes were coming in at a very low altitude, then they'd be within 10 miles of us before we could pick them up. But if they were coming in at 20,000 feet, we could get them at 150 miles out. On that first day, a 700-plane force, half of them kamikaze, struck the American fleet in successive waves. Okinawa was the worst part of the war so far as the kamikazes was concerned, because I think it was 26 in the first 32 days. We were in general quarters. As the weeks wore on, large numbers of kamikaze were shot down, but many did manage to get through, often with devastating success. The plane uh, came in from, uh, from the back part of the ship, it came in and dropped its, its bomb that went into number three elevator and then crashed into uh, uh, the flight deck just forward of the number two elevator, which was a midship. We had planes that were gassed, ready to go, and loaded with torpedoes and bombs, and we were on fire. The hangar deck was uh, also on fire. 
I'd gotten up to the hangar deck and joined a group of six or seven guys on the on fire hose trying to fight the fire. We didn't have foam to use, it was, uh, it was water. But uh, we did manage to uh, contain the fire as much as possible and got it out before it got to the planes that were loaded with bombs and frightening, very, very frightening. It's been hot, oh, terribly hot in there. You know, you either won the battle of, uh, of the fire or you lost it. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be a, a winner. Many of the carrier crews were not so lucky. I had a fire on the hangar deck, and we got out of the compartment just fine and had the fire out. And uh, the doctor told me, he said, all right, Howard, so there's your first one. And there was a man laying curved around the tail wheel of an airplane. And he said, get him out. And I reached for the man, being my first one, you know. I don't know, reluctantly, I sort of backed off maybe a little bit. And he said, get him because he won't hurt you now. And when I pulled a man's ankles to pull him out of there, the meat came off in my hands. That was bad. By June the 21st, the battle for Okinawa was won, but at a terrible price. The US Navy had suffered 5,000 wounded, and almost 5,000 men had been killed. When we did have deaths at sea, they would take the bodies and sew them up in a canvas, and they'd place a five-inch shell between their legs before they sewed the canvas up. Then they were laid out on number two elevator or so forth that hang out over the side of the ship. And then at the funeral service, there was a card that we had of men in uniform. And they would tilt these boards up all at one time and slide the bodies into the water. At Okinawa, the Japanese had expended over 1,900 kamikaze aircraft. They sank 32 Allied ships and damaged more than 400 others. Amazingly, no carrier was sunk, but it was the bloodiest battle of the Pacific. The enormous cost of taking Okinawa convinced President Truman that there was only one solution to end the war, the use of the atomic bomb. One week later, Japan surrendered. After four long years, the bloody battle for the Pacific had taken the US carriers from Pearl Harbor to the Bay of Tokyo. Admiral Mitcher, the man who created Task Force 58, the one always in the thick of action, delivered a fitting tribute to the flat tops. Japan is beaten, and carrier supremacy defeated her. It was the um, Essex-class carrier which took the war to the enemy and uh, helped to uh, gain a total conclusion of the Pacific War. The carriers took the war to where it was needed, and I think without the carriers, we would have still been fighting. <laughs> That's easy. We were losing World War II when I went into service. 
and I was a sailor up at Great Lakes. They were building the Yorktown, which was the second Yorktown, really, and uh, they needed to get it ready to go to sea. So they took a thousand of us, sailors, and put us on the Yorktown while they were building it. In fact, it didn't even belong to the Navy yet. And that's how I came up to be aboard the Essex class carrier. Oh yes, certainly. Because uh, when I first went down there, I was going through the shipyard and I kept asking the sailor that was in charge of it, where's my ship, where's my ship? I don't see my ship. And he says, see that building down there? And it was a huge warehouse. And I says, I don't see it. He says, it's looking over the top of the warehouse. And that's when I was impressed with its, its immense size. It was sitting on the other side of the building. You could see it sticking up. Well, I worked on the bridge as a quartermaster. That ship's control. Now, we were the enlisted men that controlled the ship on the bridge. We worked with the captains and the admirals. And when we say control, that's steering it, controlling its speed, riding along the weather and everything else, all those duties that we performed. Well, the, the noise takes precedent and eliminates everything you're doing. In other words, uh, the first part of the war, we, we put our battle shields up. That was uh, the metal that covered the portholes. But we found out if, if a plane hit the bridge, he'd go in one side and out the other, and you're all gone. So we just left the ports open so we could see what's going to hit us <laughs> rather than put them up. Consequently, we had four five-inch guns, that's two turrets, firing in front of us, and a quad of 40s in front of us, that's four, and quads on top and a battery of 20 millimeters. And if they all got fired at one time, you couldn't hear a thing. You know, I, I, wa I was aware of your presence and that's all. And uh, the five-inch is one of the noisiest guns the Navy had. It's more than the 16, a 16-inch 16 gun Woosh. And uh, the 5 inch 38s would make a bang like that. And you got them firing rapid fire. Those were rapid fire. The, the, you were like you're walking three inches above the deck when those guns are firing. Everything on the bridge is shaking. Rate, telephones would jump out of the cradles. We had little springs on the telephones so they'd stay in the, st in the cradle. And, and the bulkheads would bounce back and forth like my arm illustrated. Uh, it, it was rather hairy. And the helmsman, and then the, the cordite smoke had come back in the helmsman, and the, the helmsman, he's working in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> it never was ghastly. Uh, yeah, we men blown up and everything. The uh, first time I was in combat, I remember I told you that we had 14 helmsmen. Only one guy could steer the ship at a time. And I had a gunner's mate by the name of gunner's mate hollered and come down and he strapped me in a 20 millimeter cannon. I never fired one of them in my life on the starboard side. This Jap torpedo plane attacked from the port side. Now, again, you, on occasions in combat, you feel like a damn fool. I got earphones on. Fire control is telling me, watch your sector. Now, that means you just look straight ahead and back and forth, no matter what happens behind you or on a side. You watch your sector to be able to fire in that sector. Watch your sector. Well, what in the hell is the guns on the port side shooting at? I can't see because the Allen structure's in the way. You know, all right, that's my first detection. The next thing I know, that big burning torpedo plane shot over my shoulders and crashed in the water right in front of us. That was my first introduction that you could get hurt in the war. The 20 millimeter, I always called it a vengeance gun. The big five inch, we'd open up so far out that we would get the enemy plane's attention and they would be bouncing their shells around him and exploding and, and had him very wary. Then the 40 millimeters would come into play and those are the babies that shot down most of the enemy planes. 
Now, you still haven't fired your 20 millimeter. And if you, if you fire 20, he's already there. He's not only in your backyard, he's over it, see? And the whole thing that you did with a 20, you made damn sure, even if he hits you or is gonna drop something on you, he's not gonna get away. Now, that was true with the Yorktown. It shot down 15 Jap planes and not a single one of them got away. No Jap attacking the ship ever got back to tell about it. But the 20 would just tear him up because it was almost point blank firing. Almost. Now that's kind of how it started. So nine in the morning, we were launching planes, and a George, that's a fast Japanese plane, broke into the formation on its own. He flew right straight towards the Enterprise, which was right next to us. Dropped a bomb, and the bomb bounced down the hangar deck or flight deck, and killed two men and stopped. Didn't go off. And the George, he flew right off the end and took off. Remember I told you about CAP, Combat Air Patrol? Well, those four guys are already upside down, and here they come. And the chap thought he got away with it, and he got splashed in a matter of minutes. He was in the ocean. All right. The chaps are still coming out. At, that's at 9 in the morning. At noontime, the carrot intrepid. She was on our starboard quarter. She gets hit. Now, she didn't have a reputation for being a real fighter. She put up one of the most gallant battles I've ever seen, fighting, fighting them planes off. She got hit and she was burning, smoking badly. We radioed her and asked her, did she want us to change course? Now, the purpose of that is you're moving the air through the carrier so the smoke doesn't interfere with your fighting, fighting fires. And she told us to mind our own damn business. That's how frustrated they were. Okay, now that was the noontime. At three o'clock, we get attacked and we got hit. We had a, a Jap, he come out of the sky right directly in front of the bridge above us. And you have about eight seconds to hit him. If you don't hit him in eight seconds, he's got you. Well, we got him, hit him. Then his bomb come off, or he let it go, one of the two. The bomb hit the bridge. It hit 11 feet from where I was standing. Didn't go off. It was a 650-pound bomb, and it scooted down through the side of the ship and went through our incinerator stack, went through the signal bridge, went through a 20-millimeter platform, ripped the legs off of a gunner, and, and blew up outside the ship between mounts 11 and 13, uh, that's on the outside of the ship, and blew in, cut all our cables. That the uh, fire control, it really left it us a mess. The ocean was even on fire. Gasoline's running down on the ocean and everything. We were in, uh, in bad shape instantly. Uh, it blew up everything I owned. My compartment was gone. All the sailors on the ship later thought I'd been killed because my bunk was blown up. I was always in my bunk. <laughs> so they thought old things gone. But uh, it, uh, that was what occurred to us. Uh, we burnt, we put fires out, we flooded. Now the ship maintained speed and our position in formation. Now we got an admiral who was in charge. This is Navy protocol. Created a very amusing thing. We're on fire, you can see it, the other ships can see us burning. And they know we had, they've seen us get hit. A few months before that, the carrier, it was a CVL carrier, was burning. And the cruiser Birmingham went next to it to help it. And it blew up and it killed about 332 men on the cruiser and almost sank three destroyers trying to help us keep in that mind. It's a smaller carrier. Well, as flagship, we're flying the flag. The admiral didn't say a word. A cruiser pulled out of formation and came over, and she's flying an admiral's flag. She's got an admiral. And since we didn't say anything, he came over and got right next to us, and he's looking at us. And the hell with him, you know, we've got carrier stuff to do. And he sent us, sent us a message. 
where is your fire? Well, the signalman, kid by the name of Schrader from Cincinnati, hollered to the bridge, says, hey, points. Admiral wants to know where the fire is. I says, Captain, he wants to know where the fire is. He says, tell him. Tell him it's against our five-inch magazine. <laughs> we we're going to blow up <laughs> if we don't get the fires out. And he gave him the message. And that cruiser turned and headed the other direction. She's throwing water about 12 feet in the air trying to get away from us. Because if we blow up, there is no cruiser. There ain't going to be casualties. There ain't going to be a cruiser that took off. So those are some of the things that happen with, with or without communications. But uh, you can, things just happen. miles off the coast of Japan, an American carrier force slang at units of the Japanese fleet is attacked by land-based enemy dive bombers. Here in the inland sea is the prelude of an epic of United States Navy warfare. Enemy losses are heavy. No serious damage has been done to our task force. Suddenly, the carrier USS Franklin is struck square amidships by two bombs from a low-diving Japanese bomber. Fully loaded planes on deck burst into flame. Bombs, rockets, and gun ammunition explode, turning the ship into a raging inferno. Without panic, crewmen fight the fires. Only superhuman bravery can save the Franklin, but her men fight on. of casualties grows as explosions continue. The Franklin burns through the day. <laughs> Chaplain Father Joseph O'Callaghan, battling heroically to save lives, cares for a critically wounded sailor. Franklin is still afloat. No ship has ever before taken such punishment and survived. Scorched and bomb torn, the carrier lies dead in the water, listing sharply. Rescue ships, without regard to their own danger, stand by to take off the wounded. 1,100 are casualties, more than 800 of these killed or missing. But 2,000 others of the Franklin's crew miraculously escape unhurt. torn flag of the Franklin still flies as under her own power again she heads for a home port. Chaplain O'Callaghan celebrates religious services aboard as the Franklin limps across the Pacific.
entering the Panama Canal in the final stretch of her incredible 12,000-mile voyage, the Franklin's wounded receive combat decorations. The crew of the Franklin who brought her through safely, heroes all. The ship that the Japanese had announced that they had sunk is now home in New York for complete repairs. The Franklin's successful battle to survive now takes its place in naval history, and she will sail forth to battle once again.